And so sometimes you're sitting there, and, uh, uh, and I realize this is a non-medication example, but for example, I taught my um, residents, you know, came to obesity and exercise. I said, don't ask them to exercise for 30 minutes, an hour a day. Ask them where they would do it. Because the answer to that's very telling, right? Because it's easy to sit there and say, well, what you should do is eat this and exercise, whatever. And then you ask, but if you don't ask them where they do it, they kind of nod at you and said, yes, doctor, we'll try. And then they go home and say, that person has no idea what my life's like. There's no place to do this, right? Or, and they probably the same thing when it comes, to, and, and so being able to understand that, to, 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 to be able to get to that. And, and to me, <laughs> One of the ways that we, one of the things that we're trying to explore, and one of the things we explored when I was pre, in that other clinic I was practicing, is, is the idea of having, um, getting people from the community, right, through institutions that exist. Uh, we're, we're looking at some of the African American churches for the African American community. Uh, and, and, and training people, they're not healthcare professionals. They're bringing the expertise and their knowledge of the community and the connections and relationships and being the bridge, but then also training them essentially to have some comfort talking to the healthcare professionals because we're in our own culture and our own world. And how do we bridge that, right? And so, and someone who can actually follow up the family and so the, and the family could share something with them. They may not necessarily share it right away, but we'll give permission for that person to share so we can move ahead, right? Or uh, figure out and, and, and connect so that when someone says, I'm, says, well, I don't want to take this medicine, they, you know, they may be afraid to tell, or I say afraid is not the right word. Um, they may have had a bad experience or someone in their family had a bad experience with the medication, right? And now that's what the doctor prescribed. And so they get the prescription and they may not necessarily say something about that, right? Doctor says, okay, just take this, blah, blah, right? After the next appointment. <laughs> And they may go home with that. They may even get it filled. They may not. Actually, a huge percentage don't, right? And then they go, well, I don't know about taking it. And maybe they'll take a couple of pills, and then they have a side effect, and they say, OK, I'm done with this one, right? And oh, by the way, the next appointment's three months. So now we're three months later, no treatment, right? You know, I, so I mean, there's lots of, so I think there, we, we have to figure out a team approach. And then again, I think with the, uh, the, the role the pharmacists can play as well, because usually they're a little more accessible and also have, uh, frankly, a, a, a you know, more specific knowledge about medication. Uh, so I, I think that what we need to do is create more of a team, so on, both on the health professional side and, as well as in the community side, that's gonna help bridge those and, and cause those, make that communication happen and, and facilitate that as well. I think those are some of the things we need, we need to, 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 to look at. Uh, because frankly, you know, and, and actually we should also figure out a way to get it paid. Because it's actually going to save us a lot of money. And that's one of the challenges also that we have to think about and, uh, is, is that, um, I'll tell you, on the state government side, one of the things that I've had to struggle with is trying to talk about how do we invest in something to make the change so we can actually um, have the savings. I had an interesting conversation with the governor uh, once because he was talking about the coordinated care initiative. I think Gary may appreciate this. I, I know he left for his other meeting. Um, he was complaining about how the, um, how, how, how the initiative was having trouble and wasn't working. And I looked at him and I said, when you're trying to make change, you have to invest enough resources into actually making the change happen before you can expect any savings. If you're simply doing something to extract money out of it, it's not gonna work by itself, right? right? We gotta, if we're gonna try to change the way people do things, then we need to invest what we need, we need to invest in actually the, having the change happen first, and then the savings will come. If you don't invest in making the change happen, you don't be surprised that the savings don't come because nothing's changed. That goes back to actually back to the implementation. You talk about you'll pass a law. What's the next law? So, uh, so that, I think that's what we got to figure out how to, how to do, how to get those, how to invest, and then actually make the change in people's lives. And I think we will see the improvements and 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 and, and, and outcomes as well as, as savings. Sort of a long answer to your question, but anyway. No. Okay. Uh, okay. Yes. So wouldn't that tie in then to pharmaceutical price controls on biologics and investing in biologics and 
biopharma and latest and greatest biologics that are going to be coming out to help patients uh, specifically with chronic illnesses uh, that need to be treated with those biologics. Um, I'm thinking price controls are on them as not good and investing in that industry is a good thing for patients and, so, and lowering those costs in the long term. So, when, so um, you know, one of the things that uh, on a policy level we're trying to f struggling with and appreciate, you know, people thinking about this is, is that um, let's just take um, the, the new uh, treatment for hepatitis C. Right? It's a good example. And it's a good example of some of the challenges and dilemmas we have, right? And um, the development, and, and you know, the development of, of, uh, of, of new medications, particularly biologics, takes a tremendous amount of investment, right? I mean, they, that was, it was, it was over a billion, right? And I'm not, going to, I'm not here to try to justify what Gilead did, but I think it speaks to a lo the larger issue that we, you know, and, and I'll tell you, uh, I, I, uh, I, I had a relative who died of hepatitis C. Now, back then, there was no treatment. I mean, let's put it this way. There was no effective, there was no cure. We have a treatment. In fact, ironically, part of the reason we don't have to spend as much money on the previous, tre on the pre previous treatment, because that treatment had such bad, the side effects were so terrible that most people can tolerate it. Now we have a medication that people can tolerate that actually cures people. So it's, I mean, it's a substantive improvement. It's not just, I mean, one of the challenges, one of the challenges we had before were Me Too drugs, right? Another drug that really wasn't that much better, and then, you know, people, but then they would, what do you do when you have a drug, and what do we do about that price, you know, how do we invest? How do we attract people to invest in that development? And then what's that pricing? And you know, one question, let's say, is this: How much? How much is a cure for Alzheimer's worth? If someone said we can do it, if you we, and I'm not, you know, we invested roughly what would then be initially a hundred thousand. It cost people hundred thousand. I didn't realize pricing and costs aren't the same, but right, two hundred fifty thousand, a million, and 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 that's one of the things, you know, that that's one of the things that when we're thinking about what how we want to do policy, is is that you know we have there's. If we want things to continue to move forward, what do we do to be sure that people are going to invest? Because there's no guarantee when you invest the money. If you're the person investing, they can't promise you that they're actually going to come up with something that works, right? So you have to find a way, unless, unless you have the government, and to a certain degree through NIH, we invest, you know, we take public funds and we put it into basic science research. And unfortunately, we've been reducing that over time. That investment has been not, you know, has not been growing. Uh, so then the question is, we want the private sector to do that. Then what's their, what kind of return they're going to want? If you're, especially when you're talking, you're not, you're not going to go fund me a billion dollar drug development, right? Or $10 billion, it's just probably not going to happen. So it, then it's going, then it's going to be about people saying, well, I want a return on this. And it has to be a return that's as good as someplace else I can put my money into put my money into a car that drives without a driver, or put my money into, you know, uh, in, in, into building electric, you know, whatever, you know, the next iPhone gadget or whatever. I mean, it, has, it basically has to be a competitive return. Otherwise, why not put the billion dollars there? Then the question is, is that what, so, um, and so those are things we have to, if, if we want someone to develop the next big, big cure, right? So. Um, so those are some of the things that we got to figure out. How do we do the policy around, right? Once someone's developed it, it's great to say, "Oh, look, someone developed it. The cost to produce it is only X, and so forth." But, and and we are struggling also, unfortunately, with medication shortages too. Um, you know, methotrexate been around forever. It's yeah, you, you know about the shortage, right? Yes, right. And so the question is, is that is our policy right to be sure that people have access to that? Medication, right? Is is it being underpriced in some ways? Um, and so, 
so I think we, there's a lot of things to try to, 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 to figure out. Obviously, you know, we, we need to be sure that uh, there are, there, you know, there needs to be price, there needs to be pressures on pharmaceutical companies that they don't overprice because otherwise, you know, what's the use of a drug if you can't take it, right? Can't afford it, right? That's one side. The flip side, if you don't, if the drug doesn't exist, then no one's going to benefit from it either, right? So it's, it's how do we balance this, dude? Sure. Yeah. No, it, it's a, it's it's a huge it's a it's it's a huge it's a huge dilemma that we we've have to that we need to figure out. I mean, the great news is that actually people are starting to develop these medications. I mean, and so we actually have better alternatives and ones with fewer side effects and hopefully ones that actually have not just a little better, right? They said, do we need another me too drug on something? But actually, is a leap forward. And then how do we assure people have access to that? In a way, right? I mean, I, th I think fundamentally, I think there's no disagreement about that, right? So how 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 do we do that? And that that's something that uh, that I think we're going to continue to to struggle with. I mean, it's great. I mean, as a physician, as a scientist, uh, you know, biophysics major, it's very exciting what people are able to do with biologics, our new understanding of the immune system, our new understanding of uh, of, 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 the, of physiology, and so forth, uh, you know, neurology. It's it's very exciting. The challenge is how do we turn that back to, you know, how, how do we turn that into something that, uh, that actually results in people getting uh, better outcomes, significantly better outcomes, and right? So it's not only about having a drug that works and works better, if people can't get to it, <laughs> it doesn't do anything either, right? If only a handful of people can get it, it's not doing anything either, right? So, yeah. Okay. All right, well, again, thank you. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Pan, for joining us today. And thank you so much for your support of the Scripture Future campaign. So now we are ready to um, have our next panel. And um, this panel will explore patient engagement, specifically in the context of the Scripture Future Medication Adherence Challenge, which was one of the unexpected programs to come out of the Scripture Future campaign. So I invite all the panelists actually to go ahead and come up and take your place here to bring your tent cards. And um, the moderator for the panel today will be Sarah um, Deguia, who is with the executive director of the California Pan-Ethnic Health Network. The network is a multicultural advocacy organization dedicated to improving the health of communities of color in California. So welcome to Sarah and the rest of the panel. Yeah, I think you can be here. Yeah. Um, great. So I look forward to your presentations. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, Rebecca. So welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Um, as uh, Rebecca mentioned, I am the executive director of the California Panethnic Health Network, and we are a multicultural health advocacy organization focused on improving the health of communities of color. And we began, we started really getting involved in looking at medical adherence and, um, you know, pharmaceutical sort of how do you, how does the patient engage in with their physician and with their medical, um, their medications because a large portion of the constituents that we represent are limited English proficient. And so, you know, as we were doing research, the, the, the bottle, the, the, the um, pharmaceutical bottle is sort of the patient's first and best source of information, aside from obviously the, the, the doctor who's prescribing. But what we found over and over again is that individuals didn't have access to the translated materials. And so as we've been working with um, and partnering with different leaders, you know, we've been really been exploring how do we ensure that limited English proficient individuals Individuals have access to the to those um, translated information on their label, and you know. I think non-adherence, there's many different reasons why people are not able to adhere to their medical regimens. And we know that um, our students are some of our best um, hopes for making sure that we kind of change the culture. And so training that next generation of individuals is really, really important. And so I'm here today to talk about the script, your future, and the, all of the panelists here today I just talk about some of the projects that they've been working on. So the script, your future medication adherence team challenge, it's a two-month-long outreach um, competition, and it engages interdisciplinary student teams 
from pharmacy, medical, nursing, many different other health professions, kind of as what Dr. Penn was talking about, the need to bridge um, with different um, health physicians or health professions. And the idea is to develop innovative solutions and outreach to communities to raise awareness and improve understanding about why medical adherence is so important. Um, so I'm gonna... There we go. So this panel is gonna talk about that challenge and some of the activities. Um, since the challenge started, more than 5,000 future health professionals from more than 100 schools have participated. And teams have represented, um, have included representation from schools of medicine, pharmacy, nursing, occupational therapy, physical therapy, social work, business, just to kind of give you a sense of, again, this broad range of, um, of interdisciplinary work work. The teams have, um, have held more than 1,000 events in 35 states and the District of Columbia, and they have counseled more than 39,000 patients um, and have been reaching more than 14 million patients nationwide. So the challenge gives out two national awards, um, and the awards are focused in the following categories, underrepresented communities' needs, communications and media outreach, creative interdisciplinary team event. Um, and the pharmacies, um, the pharmacy schools from Northern California have been recognized in every challenge for outstanding projects. In two of the three challenge years, the local schools have taken um, top honors among target um, target medical projects or target market projects. So a couple of the folks here, the um, Toro University School of Pharmacy and the University of Pacific hold this distinction. Um, and the winning schools are each presented with a plaque and they receive stipends towards future outreach activities and a profile on the website. Um, so for today's afternoon, this afternoon's panel, each of the school's representative are gonna talk about um, the, the projects that they've worked on. Um, and so, and then we're gonna have a little discussion about you know, what worked, what are some of the challenges that they faced um, so that you can have a chance to delve a little deeper into their presentations. So let me introduce the panelists. Um, and their bios are in, in your packets for more information. Kajwa Lor is a pharmacist and assistant professor with Char University California School of Pharmacy in Vallejo. Faye Arim is a third year pharmacy student at the University of Pacific's Thomas, at Thomas J. Long School of Pharmacy. Stephanie Wong is a fourth-year pharmacy, pharmacy student at the University of California, San Francisco. And Vasira Gupta is a um, pharmacist and associate professor at the California um, North State University, sorry, North University College of Pharmacy um, here in the Sacramento area. Um, so I'm going to, uh, let's see, do we know who's going to go first? Yeah. So I'm going to be talking about um, the initiatives at Turo University. I'm the faculty ambassador for Scripture Future with our campaign. I'm excited to share with you all of the different outreach events that Turo University has um, accomplished this in 2013 and in 2014. So um, I'm just gonna talk about our events. So we actually reached about 1,000 patients back in 2013 when we received the Underrepresented Community Outreach Award. And then in 2014, we actually reached up to 3,000 patients. And it, wasn't be, it wouldn't be possible without my group of student pharmacist leaders, as well as the interdisciplinary uh, uh, teams that, that we created. And so we, at at Toro University, there is, we are on an island. It's called Mare Island. And um, there's the College of Medicine, there's the College of Education and Health Sciences, there's a public health and then nursing uh, schools. And so what we did is we created that team of, uh, of different student leaders. And then from there, we were able to have uh, different events that were put in place. And we have six community events and six partnerships with faculty. That's how we uh, accomplished the amount of patients that we were able to see. And the community events would range from health fairs um, or student-run free clinics, uh, as well as clinics in Berkeley. Um, or even um, going to farmers markets and those kind of things. And then the partnerships with faculty, that would be including myself. I'm a clinical pharmacist at Ole Health. And so we actually implemented uh, for the months of January and February weekly events within my own clinic where we would promote medication adherence using the Scripture Future materials and we would collect that data. 
So I'm going to share with you one of the most creative events um, that we received the award back in 2014. Um, and as you all know, you guys might have to commute to work, right? And so um, in Vallejo, it's unique because we have there's a ferry building. And so there's a ferry that goes from Vallejo to San Francisco. And some some people usually use that service. And so we focused on something that was unique within our city. And so the students actually put together a team that promoted medication adherence at the ferry building. So we're going to show you a little video of what they created. Hi, my name is Yi Kwan, and I'm an inpatient intern pharmacist. We strive to provide the best care possible for our patients. And this is why medication adherence is so important so that when patients are discharged, they will not be re-admitted back with the same problem. Hi, my name is Ryan Dreyer. I'm a first year MPH student at Toro University, and I'm going to be entering medical school in the fall. As a future physician and a public health practitioner, the Script My Future program is important to increase medical compliance or med medication taking compliance among people so that we can help them to lead better and healthier lives. My name is Megan Call. I'm in the Master of Public Health program at Tory University and uh, also a candidate for physician assistant applying next year. And um, I have type 1 diabetes and Script My Future is important not only to me but also the community for taking medication to try to decrease diabetes disparities. I'm Alexa. Sometimes do miss taking my medication. I do forget, um, so I pledge to take my meds. I pledge I will take my meds. I will pledge to take my meds. I pledge my grandparents to take their meds. I pledge for my friends to take their meds. I pledge to take my meds. I pledge to take my meds. I pledge that my dad will take his meds. I pledge my friend will take her meds. I am Rachel and diabetic, and I plan to take my meds. My name is student Dr. Brian Cullen. First year column at Toro University. I pledge to support my patients in taking their medications. My name is Jesse Alejandro. I'm a second year medical student, and I pledge to have my future patients take their medication. My name is Steven Van, and I'm a second year at the College of Pharmacy, and I pledge to remind my future patients to take their medications. My name is Jasmine Reber, and I'm a second year pharmacy student, and I pledge for the patients in the pharmacies to take their meds. Hi, my name is Jeannie Duong. I'm a first year PA student, and I pledge to make sure my future patients take their meds. Hi, my name is Jennifer Chose. I'm a first year physician's assistant student, and I pledge to have my future patients take their medications. So my name is Faye. I'm representing the University of Pacific, and I'm um, part of the Script Your Future. We did something a little bit different this year. We tried to categorize three main topics. One was awareness, and the way we did it is we created these sweaters that says Script Your Future, and on them we have a, a logo. So we came up with this um, logo. So we came up with this logo and the design and that we would wear at the health fairs, as well as t-shirts that we would wear at health fairs to help promote the Script Your Future. Um, also, we created a website, which we had over 7,000 views, Facebook posts, which with over 200 views per photo that we would post. And we also had YouTube videos where we created, um, everything was created on our own, and we had over 2,000 uh, views on that, um, as well as creating a, a decal that says, I took the pledge, when will you? And then the hashtag, script your future. So we encouraged um, the people that would come to our events to post these on their cars or things so then we can bring awareness. In addition to that, um, we gave out handouts. So our handouts would have information and we put them all in folders. And this was for over, um, 2,000 patients that we did this for. And they were actually translated into different languages so then they could all understand it. We also created storybooks. So these are things that we actually did on our own. We drew and came up with the storyline. Um, this one is about immunizations. And then we have one about asthma. So we really tried to target not just elderly, but 
little kids and um, just a whole range of uh, age groups. So we did do um, health fairs, and so we went out to different schools, elementary schools, middle schools, and we went to uh, health fairs for elderly. And um, we participated in over 12 health fairs. And we also created a board, which um, we had it as a blackboard, and we gave patients chalk. And they would write why it was important for them to script their future, why it was important for them to be adherent to their medication. And then we also left local, uh, or we left wallet cards at local pharmacies, so then the pharmacies can hand that out to their patients. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? My name is Stephanie Wong. I'm a fourth year pharmacy student at UCSF. And this challenge is unique for me because this was actually my third year running um, the campaign for UCSF. I started as a P1 and got to develop it each year as I learned more and more. And I've just structured it to complement our education and to encourage our students to be more proactive about helping out our patients. And so our team composition was interprofessional, was primarily led by a team of 29 pharmacy students with strong participation from nursing, dental, and medicine throughout our campaign. And our campaign was really built upon creating an impact in the community. We wanted to mobilize student leaders as well as inspire and empower our patients um, along with healthcare professionals. And our primary audience included San Francisco and Bay Area residents. We utilized our students to reach out to local pharmacies throughout California and distributed over 1,300 wallet cards that way because we didn't want people to have a reason to say, I don't know what medications I'm taking. So we wanted to provide the resources that way. Um, we also outreach to family and friends through social networking. We had a very popular Facebook page. We also utilized Twitter and Instagram. And we also have a Script Your Future website, which can be easily found through a simple Google search. And one of our most successful and I think most creative outreaches that we worked on this year is we actually um, created this Vietnamese TV talk show segment. And with that, we recruited students, first year students, to help us write scripts about situations that you might encounter with chronic conditions such as diabetes, asthma, and hypertension. And then we would have you know, older students rev revise those scripts and then also have our faculty also look over our scripts to make sure that the health literacy level um, is something that patients can understand. And then we had those translated into Vietnamese to you know, remove that barrier because we always talk about language being a barrier um, and not allowing it to reach the most amount of people that we possibly could. And then we went to the TV station, there's a picture of us um, on the bottom right corner, and we filmed that segment, and it was broadcasted on this Vietnamese news station. Each broadcast uh, reached viewers about 250,000 people um, worldwide, and it was broadcasted two times, as well as released on YouTube. So I think that was one of our strongest campaign events. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Can you all hear me? Yes, okay. Uh, my name is Vasudha Gupta. I am the, an assistant professor and faculty liaison for Scripture Future at California North State University College of Pharmacy. We are extremely fortunate to have um, Sacramento as one of the six pilot cities for Scripture Future. So in addition to participating in the challenge for the last three years, we worked really closely with Elaine, our field organizer, to have a number of community service events here in the Sacramento region. So some of the ones that we've consistently participated in over the last few years, as you can see on the screen, Showers of Blessing Church, we've been there for the last four years, Vietnamese New Year's Festival, which actually we collaborate with Toro University College of Pharmacy, we participated in that event for the last three years, the Mong Health Fair, also again for the last three years um, we participated in, and in addition to providing education regarding the importance of medication adherence, the students also conducted blood pressure screenings and cholesterol screenings and blood glucose screenings at these events, and provided influenza vaccinations at some of the events that they were doing. So 
in regards to the challenge, we've uh, mostly collaborated with CSU Sacramento College of Nursing for the challenge that we've done in January and February. One of our most successful events, um, we received recognition in 2014. We were one of the finalists for the challenge. And what the students did is they created a mock video using our school pharmacy where they showed the outlook of a patient who was non-adherent to their medications. And then they had the same patient showing a scenario where they were, they were adherent to their medications and showing that they were um, enjoying life with their friends and family rather than suffering from a heart attack or a stroke. So I'd like to just have everyone give you a round of applause again for all the great work that you've done. So while folks in the audience are thinking of some of their questions, I'll just kind of kick it off to all of the panelists and talk about kind of what gave you the inspiration to work with the communities that you're focused on. Was it sort of data driven that you knew that there were some disparities? Was it really because these are the communities that you're surrounded with? Or you know, what were some of the, the reasons why you chose to do the outreach strategies that you did with the communities that you worked with? And maybe we'll just start um, with Lizuda first. So again, I think we're really fortunate to be here in the Sacramento region because most of the students at the College of Pharmacy are of Asian American descent. So these students are involved in their communities, in the Vietnamese community, community, in the Hmong community. So it made sense for us to reach out to those communities and to those partners um, to promote some of the Scripture Future activities. So it was a natural partnership for us, and we were able to identify, or the students were able to identify that early on. We didn't just hold our health fairs in um, Stockton. We did it all over Northern California. So we tried to figure out what was the problems that why people weren't adherent, and we tried to go from there. One of the things I forgot to mention is we made little stickers to put on the pill bottles for patients that are illiterate, because a lot of them can't read. So um, that actually helped out a lot, and the patients loved it. So we tried to figure out what was the problem not at just Stockton community, but in all the different areas that we targeted and then just create something for each community. Hello, okay. So I, was, I would say the same things as well as, I think California, I feel like in general, we just have a very diverse population. And then it happened to also be that the health fairs that we were having um, were also uh, with the Vietnamese, Hmong, Hispanic community with my clinic in itself. And I think it just naturally, that's what the patient population we decided to serve. Um, just because the even the data shows that patients that have um, language barriers or cultural barriers, those are the patients that are generally not more not adherent, and so that's why we chose those populations. I think in San Francisco and I think UCSF, in general, we really pride ourselves because we have a very diverse student body, and I think we really wanted to take advantage of that. We have students that speak multiple languages, and so we really wanted to translate that into you know, the community sense. But I think on a personal level, I think adherence was something that I cared about. We're having worked in a retail setting. I would get patients that would come to me all the time, and they would say, I, just, I have no idea what medications I'm taking, and I just really kind of couldn't believe it. And so I think part of my motivations was I wanted to show people that I actually really care, but you know, another component is I want patients themselves to really care. And so I think by showing them our passion, we can get them to really care about their future. That's great. Any questions from the audience? Culturally, if we're working in these different communities, what are the barriers from, I mean, I think about, and I'll just give one example. From a home health nurse, I remember taking care of a patient in our community, this is up in Northern California in Butte County, that was Hmong, and she w moved with her family, was, in, was the elder in the family, and I remember her thinking that her insulin was magic in a bottle, and once that magic was gone, she was cured. So that was an example. We had no concept of that as a health professional. And so it was fascinating to us that this was even going on. Are there other cultural aspects similar to that that 
as a practitioner, we should be aware of so that we can maybe approach our teaching in a different way? Do, am, I ma am, am I making sense to what I'm asking? Are there other issues like that that we should be aware of? So I think we discussed this at the table as well, but I see at my clinic, we see a lot of patients that are, that are Asian Americans. And if any of you have worked with those populations, you know they have a very large disbelief in Western medications and they don't want to take medication and they don't think they need it. So I don't know if I've found a cure around it, but I think just educating patients on the importance of medication and care have their medication list in front of you going through all of those medications. I think that helps explain to them why the medications are so important and how they're helping them. And that seems to help a little bit, but like I said, it's not a cure all to what their beliefs in. But I think having that understanding, recognizing that there are cultural beliefs that come into play, I think that's probably the first thing that you can do to build that trust with your patient who have a natural distrust in healthcare providers. I would also just say, I mean, I think having this sort of community liaison, like where there's a community that's there, that's sort of stable, I think utilizing, even if it's a community-based organization that kind of serves as that liaison is sometimes also helpful to be that barrier, or that bridge, I should say, between the medical profession. Because it really is, you know, as people are, people do sort of look back and go, oh, to, you know, they had kind of an awe of their providers. And, you know, as you sit in the provider's office, sometimes you really only take a small piece, piece of what they're saying um, because of time, because you're nervous for many different reasons, and then you add on cultural, language, other types of barriers, and I think it really impedes people from, real, from truly understanding. So I think utilizing some of those community liaisons can also be, be helpful, and really taking advantage of you know, students and, and other individuals in the healthcare team that can kind can, of can help to, again, bridge some of those cultural differences too. In the back, sorry. Um, hi, Jen Burst, California Quality Collaborative. Um, so kind of going off of what you are just saying in that question prior, um, do you ever, is it part of any of your strategies um, and in your schools to talk about partnering with community-based organizations or kind of going through a checklist to have those liaisons or to have like that cultural interpreter, you know, I mean, cultural and linguistic interpreter, is that something that you do or talk about or are trying to develop? So um, at, when, with our initiatives that we're doing, I, we actually implemented several of the aspects that I actually would do within my own clinic. For example, like I work with a mainly Spanish speaking population and our medication lists are in Spanish for them to understand as well as using those wallet cards, but as well as um, creating like educational things that the, stu the patients will understand in a simple um, manner. And so a lot of the initiatives, I feel like with each organization, you wanna specify or tailor it within your org own organization, but being able to share those materials from, for example, my organization, Olay Health, with my current students so that when they go into a health fair that's mainly Spanish speaking, we're using materials that are culturally competent for those patients so they understand it. Um, and then going back to the the one about the Hmong um, patient, I think that's such an um, interesting experience because I think a lot of patients that I am Hmong myself, and so thinking about that belief of having a cure um, and being able to tell them that there really is no cure.